Okay, a good Wednesday evening to you. Hope you're well. And thank you for uh, being a part of our midweek study tonight. Uh, we're going to finish this three lesson series that we've been in, A Christian Defined. And I want to start uh, this evening with this. I've got here um, an ancient letter or at least the contents of an ancient letter um, from AD 112 they say okay so very old it was written by a politician really one politician to another politician so there was this man named Pliny P-L-I-N-Y he was a Roman governor of an area called Pontus or Bithynia in the ancient world and he wrote this letter uh, part of which I'm going to read uh, to the governor not the governor the emperor of Rome at the time whose name was Trajan so this is a letter uh, from this governor named Pliny to the emperor Trajan and the essence of the letter is he has some questions um, for the emperor about how to deal with this group of people he had encountered um, that were known as Christians. Okay, so you, you get the idea, you get the setting. That's that's this letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, it's a bit wordy, but uh, a couple portions of it here to to get us into our scripture for the evening. So, Pliny <clears throat> to the Emperor Trajan, he says at the opening, It's my practice, my lord, to refer to you all matters concerning which I am in doubt. For who can better give guidance to my hesitation or inform my ignorance? I have never participated in trials of Christians. I therefore do not know what offenses it is the practice to punish or investigate and to what extent, and I have not been I, I have been not a little hesitant as to whether there should be any distinction on account of age or no difference between the very young and the more mature, whether pardon is to be granted for repentance or if a man has once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one. Whether the name itself, even without offenses, or only the offenses associated with the name are to be punished. Then he says, Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with, with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. Then I'll skip down to... Uh, one of the last parts of his, his letter to the emperor. He says, Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. I therefore postponed the investigation and hastened to consult you, for the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because of the number involved. For many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes are and will be endangered. For the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and farms. Again, the letter of Pliny a Roman governor to the emperor at the time, Trajan, asking, what should I do about all these Christians? 
112 BC, not long at all after the close of the New Testament period. And to think those are your brothers and sisters in Christ that he was interrogating and executing for being Christian. Well, about 50 years before that letter, another letter was written to approximately the same region, which today, you know, on our maps would be uh, the, the area of Turkey. Um, this letter was written to Christians who lived in places like Pontus, Bithynia, and it was written not by a politician, but, but by an apostle, a man named Peter. And with great, great love and concern, Peter wrote this to Christians, uh, and in particular tonight, in the fourth chapter of 1 Peter, verses 12 through 19. Let's listen to what he says to Christians. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an adulterer, uh, excuse me, or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who, who do not obey the gospel of God. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Again, that's 1 Peter 4, verses 12 through 19. So we've been talking about this idea of... Uh, what is a Christian or a Christian defined? And uh, the way we're approaching it is we have been looking at each time that the word Christian appears in the Bible. It only occurs three times. And so that's three lessons uh, that we've had, this, this being the third. And, and just sort of looking at each time it appears and what does that particular text say about what a Christian is? So, uh, we started in um, Acts chapter 11, remember, and learned that a Christian is one who truly belongs to Jesus Christ. A Christian is a person who is different, distinct from the world around them, and that a Christian is a known person. They're not anonymous in their faith, but they are known for it. That's sort of what we get from the first time that word is used. And then in uh, the other place in the book of Acts, in chapter 26, we learn that a Christian is a bold persuader. Remember the Apostle Paul used the word during one of his trials, one of his hearings. And uh, so a Christian is, like him, a bold persuader and unashamed of the message of the gospel and willing to proclaim it and, and take it to those that they come in contact with. So this evening we're looking at this last occurrence of the word Christian in Scripture. And, of course, we read it right there in First Peter 4. And I think what we see here in this text is that a Christian is a joyful sufferer. A joyful sufferer. It's interesting here in First Peter 4, there are two surprising or strange things mentioned. The first is um, in back in verse 4. And we didn't read verse 4 of chapter 4, but if you go back there uh, to sort of get the context, Peter says that the world is surprised by Christians 
when Christians do not join with them in their sinful ways. Uh, when they're surprised when they witness Christians who do not participate in their debauched lifestyles. Um, and, and they're surprised because maybe they did at one time, you know, before they became Christians, but now they're trying to live holy lives and so they no longer do so. That is surprising or strange to the world, Peter says. And then in, in the passage we read in verse 12, Peter tells Christians not to be surprised when suffering comes their way as a result of their faith. Uh, specifically, he says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. It is not strange, the apostle says, for a Christian to suffer. So, you know, anytime I, I see something like that, I, I ask myself, and so I ask you tonight too, uh, do you ever suffer as a Christian? Um, now, I don't mean the kind of suffering that, that comes from all people, you know, from illness or accidents or things like that, just part of living in this fallen world, that's a different category than what I'm referring to. I mean, do you suffer for being a Christian? Uh, now, if you were to do everything that the world does, and if you were to live, you know, an ungodly life, an unholy life like the world, there wouldn't be any of this kind of suffering involved, you see. But if you really live a Christian life, if you live a life that is truly distinct and different from the world, then there probably will be suffering. In fact, Jesus promises it. Um, and the New Testament writers, like Peter, um, say this will happen. So throughout Peter's letter, he's discussing suffering and the Christian response to suffering. And it sounds like almost all the suffering he's talking about is is verbal abuse, okay? So not necessarily always physical, but but this verbal abuse. Christians are attacked verbally because they are Christians. They're accused, they're slandered, false charges are brought against them. And, and so Peter makes reference to this over and over. And really he does so on good authority because remember, uh, what Jesus said. Remember these words that Jesus spoke from uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Lord said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So Jesus had told them it would happen. And Peter affirms that later. It's really, you know, an amazing thing that that Jesus and then Peter, his his disciple, his apostle, say to us, you know, they say, if you're insulted by men, you are blessed by God. So if people attack you verbally because of your spiritual stance, you are really blessed. You're blessed people. Uh, be careful when you ask God to bless you because he might send you some persecution. Um, I don't know if you ever thought about it that way, but that's, that's one way that uh, a blessing can be expressed in the Christian faith. So Peter teaches us here that the Christians are joyful sufferers. We actually share in the sufferings of Christ, according to verse 13. Uh, what does that mean, and, and how is that possible? Well, we, we experience the same kinds of things that our Lord experienced when we live like he lived. Uh, people will insult us. We know Jesus was insulted. Uh, they will deride, make fun of. Um, they will correctly figure out that we're different, um, and they will sometimes harshly point that out and use that as a source of, of persecution. So if you're, if, you're, if you're in the situation where you've never or are never insulted 
for the name of Christ, um, that's probably a bad sign. If you're in the position where you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. That's verse 14. Uh, say you want to be like Jesus. One of the ways we get to be like Jesus is by experiencing suffering. Suffering actually shows that we belong to him. It shows that we are Christian. So <clears throat> remember the first definition of, of the word Christian that we gave from Acts chapter 11. What does that word mean? One who belongs to Jesus. That's really almost literally what the word means. Suffering is one of the ways that we show we really belong to him, to suffer as he suffered. Now that does not mean, and here's an important distinction, it does not mean we enjoy suffering. Um, being a joyful suffer, sufferer and, and enjoying suffering are not the same. No one likes to be called names. No one likes to be falsely accused or singled out unfairly, slandered. You don't have to like it. You just have, you know, you've been called by God to endure it. There's a difference. And, and then again, um, it is not the case that we're seeking out suffering. You know, that is not the point. That became a problem in the early church. Um, some some writings and so forth from the second century, uh, sort of like we read that letter from the Romans, but Christians are writing to one another. One of the issues that arose at some point was Christians actually seeking out suffering because they thought it was a sign of super spirituality and status almost. And that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about enjoying suffering and we're not talking about seeking it out necessarily uh, but the, the the idea is to be joyful sufferers when when Christians suffer for being Christians they're just doing what Jesus did you see that's how we share in his sufferings verse 16 in in what we read here, is where the word Christian is used for the third time in the New Testament. And notice again how it's used here. He says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Let him glorify God in that name. In what name? Well, in the name of Christ, in the name Christian. If you suffer because you're really a Christian, glorify God, is, is what Peter is, is telling us. Now, we need to make sure that the reason we're suffering is really because we're a Christian. And this is what Peter underlines here. It, it's not um, because we're doing something wrong. You know, that's not a reason to glorify God. If we suffer because we do wrong, that's not what we're talking about. That's what he says in verse 15. You know, if you're, for instance, a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler, as, as my translation said, uh, and if you're, if you're suffering because of those things, that's not a reason to rejoice. But because you're a Christian, if you suffer in that name, then glorify God. So I encourage you, uh, the next time you get name called or slandered or made fun of, or however it may express itself, because you're a Christian, respond in this way. Praise God. Now, why? Uh, that's what Peter says here. That's the proper response to suffering. Glorify God. Praise God. If someone curses you, you bless God. If they lie about you, you rejoice in the truth. Rejoice that you've been counted worthy to suffer for that name. Uh, and again, 
we might ask why why do that it seems like a strange thing a strange way to respond to suffering i mean most of the time we don't think in these terms but but peter says to us that the suffering is not strange at all he says it's not surprising at all that the world would laugh at you and ridicule you make make fun of you speak all manner of evil against you falsely nothing weird about that it's expected Jesus experienced it, and so when it comes our way, we're getting to experience the way of Jesus. We're just doing what he did and showing that we really belong to him, that we're truly one of his. And, and here's the great truth about it. When you do what Jesus did now, one day you'll get to do what Jesus does right now. What does that mean? It means that Jesus, what's he doing now? He, he now experiences the glory and blessing of being with God in eternity. And one day that's ours if we endure, if we endure to the end. Now, this passage in 1 Peter 4 closes with, with a couple of things that I think maybe have been misunderstood many times, or at least they can be. I'm, I'm referring to verses 17 and 18. Again, this is what Peter writes. He says, For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, just on the surface of that, it might almost almost seem uh, that Peter is making a statement implying that there's some uncertainty about a Christian salvation. You know, especially when he refers to the righteous being scarcely saved. So, does that mean we we ask Peter? Uh, that Christians are just barely saved, that they just sort of scrape by into heaven by the skin of their teeth, they're saved. I've heard that expression before. Well, the answer, of course, is no. A thousand times no. That would be totally out of balance with all the rest of the New Tes Testament teaching about our abundant salvation. And, and, the great assurance that we're supposed to have in Jesus. Um, no, the word here that's used in verse 18, sometimes translated scarcely, uh, scarcely saved, that word, it means with difficulty. With difficulty is really the thrust of that word. And, and it's right in keeping, you see, with everything Peter's been saying in this text. A true Christian will have some difficulty. They will be saved with difficulty. It doesn't mean they'll just barely be saved. They'll, they'll squeak into heaven. Nobody sneaks into heaven. Nobody barely gets there. Anybody who gets there gets there abundantly. So that's not what this, this is talking about. He's, in, he's keeping in context with what he's been talking about. With difficulties, they will be saved. And, and so, you know, we will experience suffering, some difficulty in this life, and sometimes that will be linked to just the fact that, that you're a Christian. That's just the way it is. The point is this. If a Christian has it tough, uh, sometimes here in this world, imagine how rough it's going to be for those who never accept Christ in the next world. How tough it's going to be in, in eternity for them who, who don't accept Christ. The eternal fate of the ungodly is far worse than the temporary suffering of the righteous. He's setting up a comparison here. And in fact, those two states, the, the eternal fate of the God, ungodly 
and the temporary suffering that we experience here, uh, they don't even compare. This slight momentary affliction, as scripture says, that we suffer in this world does not compare with the eternal weight of glory in store for those who believe in Jesus and who obey God and who truly live uh, what it means to be Christian. And so in this world, we can be joyful sufferers. We can be Christians. Hope that uh, that this look at these these texts has been insightful. I remember the first time I I studied it uh, that it meant a lot to me, and I've tried to express that that to you as well. And I encourage you to keep keep the faith, and despite what the world throws at us, because there's great things awaiting us when we do. Let's pray together as we close. God, you're so good to us, and, and we just want to be your children and to be faithful. Thank you for your word. Pray we're faithful with it tonight and that we will live it out. Thank you most of all for Jesus, our Savior. Uh, we thank you that we can share in his suffering, even though it is unpleasant to us in this world, but that we can show we belong to him by what we endure and the way we face it. Pray your blessings on all those listening uh, to this broadcast. Please take care of them and, and bless them with what they need. Thank you for hearing us as always. We pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen.